So that was sort of the, uh, the first period. And as I arrived, I set a, an ambition, which I'm prepared to be tested on tonight if you want to. Uh, something that worked for us a little in Merseyside. Um, I hope it works in there. We'll have to wait and see. You never know. Um, but we, uh, I said, the first ambition I set was that I wanted us to be the best police force in the country. Um, I, not in the sense that I want the city of London to fail or this year, sorry to fail as a result of that competition. But I genuinely believe that any public service, when it has no competition through business, uh, should keep challenging itself to get better. And if we don't set ourselves an ambition to be better, then who does it? Yeah, if you're a victim of rape in, in Hackney, It seems to me it's vital that we constantly challenge ourselves to get better. The public are kind enough to give us three and a half billion pounds every year. You don't have to do it in but the point is, is that we will get that money whether we're good or bad. So who's going to cause it to get better? So it seems to me that it's vitally important that we strive to be best. Secondly, I don't know how to strive to be second best or thirteenth best. There are 43 police forces in this country, and uh, I think it's vital that you constantly try to do what they can do something good in similar environment with similar resources, why can't we do at least as well as that? Why couldn't we improve on what they're doing? And the final reason, particularly in London, is that for those of you who I know, I know Ben will say you live there, maybe others do, or work there, or maybe you've worked there, one of the constant challenges in London is it is a huge cosmopolitan, vibrant city. And of course, if you're not careful, whether it be education, health, the police, you can say, well, this is such an incredible challenge. How can we possibly compare with anybody? You just don't understand how complex it is. Don't tell me about education attainment. Don't tell me about health challenges. Um, you can't possibly compare London to Carlisle or to Hertfordshire or wherever. And I don't accept that. I certainly don't accept it, accept it as a starting premise. I mean, it seems to me vital that you've at least got to inquire to see whether the reason you're 43 out of 43 forces is because of something you're not doing or is because of the context in which you operate. And I don't. Uh, Except the sugar of the shoulders and say, well, that's not it. You will always be in that position. Because as far as I know, it takes us as long to answer the phone as it is elsewhere. It takes us, we can find fingerprints at seems of burglary that could be found in Sheffield or Manchester. So why don't, we, why don't we find them the same way? And if we do identify burglary, why does it take us three days when everybody else does it six hours <coughs> to catch them and stop them from offending? So while I accept at some point of the analysis, you might actually Actually, London is so different in some areas, we cannot be compared, or you can understand the difference in performance. It is a starting point. You have to, I think we have to challenge ourselves to be as good as anybody else and better than everybody else where we can. So we sort of set that as an approach. The second thing I set as an approach was that we, everybody has a brand, and if you haven't experienced it in your organisations yet, I'm sure you will. And whether you join a commercial organisation or you join a public body, uh, everybody has a mantra or a mission, uh, sometimes overblown, but it's a, for me, you've got to set something to uh, set your store for. So we set out something we call total policing. Total policing means, it has three or four legs, which I'll briefly go through, but my idea is that with 50,000 people, we have about 53,000 people in there. It's a lot of people. I can guarantee that if we work as teams or as a team, we will achieve far more together than 53,000 Certain policing I know, uh, generally when people work as teams, they achieve a great deal. Contributions of individual talent, the summation of that, often achieve fantastic things that alone you just cannot achieve. So for me, it's vital that we do that. We've broken it down into, uh, into various, it, it's just really only used three or four things. But I said four, the fourth thing won't let me have. Eventually I'll get to. But uh, the, th the first one is something we call it a, a war on crime. And the, the principle behind it. I want to do everything that's legal and ethical and in good faith to put the criminal on the back door. But it has to be in those three categories. It's got to be legal, it's got to be ethical, it's got to be in good faith. But we've got to be as nimble, ambitious, creative <coughs> as criminals are because they don't work within the system. They're not constrained by the law by the very nature of it. Uh, they will not work through processes that are Byzantine and, you know, all our organisations do. I'm sure the university has no Byzantine processes. <laughs> but, but, you know, big organisations are just we organise ourselves, we get management, we get meetings, and of course criminals don't care about that. They don't care where we drew the boundaries on the map. They don't care about how much we So it's 
vitally important to me that we are as um, sometimes aggressive, but mainly about being creative in the way that we deal with different types of crime and criminals. And by saying that, I'm not saying I want to knock everybody from prison. prison. And the prison population now I think is about 86, 88,000 of the species that we and you still get crime. I'm not sure if prison is always the answer. So that's not really the point. But the point is that we ought to have a good investigation, discover people, and challenge them about their behaviour. And then leave it to the criminal justice system as to how to deal with it. The second uh, leg of what we say we want to be ambitious about is the way that we help victims, to have the total care of victims. We, in London, we have about 800,000 crimes a year. Uh, that, that ranges for a huge panoply of crime. So, at one extreme, we've got the most frequent crimes you know, criminal damage. Attacks on cars, about one in three crimes would be an attack on a car, mainly because this value bar sits parked on the street, it's available, and sadly that's what happens. We didn't have car crime before we didn't have we had cars. It's blind in the office, but people do forget. And of course, it, you know, before there were cars, there was no car crime. When there is car, there are cars. I'm not sure there are more criminal, but there's certainly more opportunity for crime that is either portable, you know, goods that are either portable, can be damaged or can be stolen from. So it just seems to me that when you know, we, we detect varying amounts of crime. We've got the, the high volume crime, the ones I've just described. And at the other extreme, we've got the very serious, but thankfully, relatively rare crimes. Murder, rape, uh, serious aggravated burglaries where somebody breaks into a house and assaults somebody, a lot run right through it. So the, frank, the, thankfully, or thankfully, there is a good um, correlation between the seriousness of the crime and frequency. The more serious, the less frequency. What it means is that we, we have differential rates of detection. Our overall rates of detection is about one in four crimes in London. Some parts of the country are about one in three. In London, it's about one in four. Murder detection rates are about 95%. Uh, there aren't a huge number of people. We're often asked to look at how well New York does, but I have to tell you, far hundreds of people die in New York as a result of use of guns and violence. Uh, we do not see, thankfully, that, uh, that number of people dying in, uh, in London as a result of homicide. We have very high detection rates in terms of murder. We have very low detection rates in terms of car crime. Uh, three broad ways that you detect crime. You have cash doing it. You have forensic links between the offender and the scene, or someone tells you that there are three broad ways that we detect crime. We always have, I suspect we always may. So if you're not prepared to put in 20 detectives or 40 detectives into a murder, as we do, but sometimes even more, if you want to make sure that we can solve these things, then your chances of solving a car crime on the street where nobody saw it happen, they didn't leave any forensic samples, there's no CCTV, and nobody tells you actually, I know he did it, and in fact, I know he saw the goods, then your chances are fairly slim, just not there, in cross proportions. So we get this differential detection rate, which leads me to think that, you know, for every victim who does not have the satisfaction of having a suspect caught or put through the criminal justice system, we still need to care for Victims come to us in various guises. There's about 800,000 people come. Sometimes they're criminals themselves. They just happen to be a victim on that occasion. They could be a victim of violence. Uh, sometimes they come with English as a second language. Sometimes they're psychiatrically ill. Sometimes they're just badly affected by the law. So it's our job to be totally professional and look after them in the best way we can. We've got limitations on resources. But it's about caring for how we do that and doing it as professional as we can. And the third leg of the total approach is to be totally professional in the first two, catching criminals or helping victims. Uh, it seems to me to have high standards and then to maintain the vital for the police and I think any public service general. So it's something that uh, we constantly got to strive to get better at our professionalism. And the final of the uh, totals, uh, which I said are not quite level land, but either, which is about the use of technology. We, uh, I suspect the Met will always be a people business. I'm going to describe it in a few seconds just how we arrange ourselves now. But it just seems to me we've got really a very poor investment. Well, we've got a large investment for a poor strategy, in my view, not only in the Met, but the police service generally, uh, in use of technology. We've got some great systems. I mean, it's not through lack of money. We spend, each year we spend about £350 million pounds on IT. And that means in three years that's a billion pounds. And yet it's crap. Well, I'm afraid. And there are two or three reasons for it. Uh, one is that most of our strategy for investment in IT is driven by legacy. What IT did we have? When did the license run out and what are we going to replace it with? Not well, what do we want to achieve with this thing, but when that license run out, what opportunity did it give us with that one billion spend over three years? 
some great systems of lists. I can tell you how many burners there were yesterday, where they were, how that compared to the year before, uh, which window did they get in. Well, what about a piece of kit that stops it happening, that catches the offender? Uh, there are pieces of technology around uh, that, that do help with that. Facial recognition with all the CCTV, people might want to debate the, the, the civil and human rights involved in that. It's a great opportunity. We have another plate for recognition camera in uh, Dublin, and this city, the uh, congestion charge. You do it, London. That's the camera that takes you to a plate and sends you a bill. That's a negative. But there are some positive aspects. It will tell you whether the car is insured, or taxed, or licensed. Uh, it will tell you whether the driver for others is wanted for murder. It will tell you whether something's out of bail and should be on curfew. These are very important things <coughs> in what is essentially, I suppose, a, a vehicle for society in helping us to intervene in crime. And there are other opportunities with technology which I honestly think we're going to make massive use of. It will reduce bureaucracy provide a better service, and it will catch more criminals. But that will need a radical shift in the way we've been spending over the years, and I'm determined <coughs> what will happen. So the officers on the street will be equipped, one, to stop crime, and two, to assist victims where we best are positioned to do that. So it seems to me that's a great opportunity. Uh, it'll take a while to shift that because of the inertia in the system, but it will happen. And the strategic shift will be that still having lots of hardware, which is like the cloud, and so like, like I said, of having very large cumbersome software, we will have more apps in the actual cubes, and that will be a way that we will achieve far more in the future. Uh, it's been too slow, but there's great opportunities, I think, for us to do something about that. In terms of the context in which we operate, we met to the sale already, 53,000 people. <coughs> we have 98 units. Uh, that of itself is a challenge, with the it? because there are so many units, not everybody knows each other. Uh, just communication in this beast uh, is a great challenge. Trying to explain what you want to happen and to hear from them why it's not happening and what you need to, I need to do to change things is a constant battle when you're trying to talk to so many people. Uh, about two thirds of the people we have are in territorial policing. So they're the police stations that you normally see, the one with the CID going out and the, the local neighborhood officers in response. Uh, then we've got about a third who are involved in other things, whether counter terrorism, suicide, and organized crime. Uh, I'm not bore you with all the list. But it's a big organisation. When I arrived in September of 2011, I wanted to do something that I'd done in Merseyside when I arrived there. I went down there in Merseyside. It was over about a 12 week period. I went round each bit of it. And I met all the middle managers and a few other people. I said, so, right, when I take over on the 24th of October, it was in uh, 2004, if you were me, what would you do differently? And it excited all sorts of uh, feedback. So a bit helpful, not always, but it, it had a resonance. There was a, <coughs> it's, it's an old trick of a consultant who told me, give me what I tell you to tell But often in organisations, it seems to me people know what to do. They're just trapped by time, they're trapped by contacts, they're trapped by the ownership of the people who are in charge at any one time. So a new arrival will generate a new opportunity to do something different. So I wanted to do the same thing in the net, and I couldn't because I'd, I'd hit the ground maybe within two weeks of taking on the job anyway. And then there were so many of them. So we did it a slightly different way. And I said, right, well, between September and Christmas, I want to see them all this middle of manuscript in 98. So during that time, 600 people traced through my office, which wasn't ideal, but it worked in, in this sense. Is that we just did it half an hour, rather than me going to where they were, particularly probably half a day in each place. Same question. Uh, and then with the team, what does this team think? You would do if you sat in this chair differently over the succeeding years, and then each of you as individuals two tell me what you because group think is great, but you can also look at some really good ideas just to get acceptance and consensus. So uh, it gave us our first list of 10 things to, uh, to look at to try and achieve over the following year, and we've made great inroads into that. But my broad point is that this is a complex piece. Uh, trying to get it to move, it, you know, when it moves all together, like in the Olympics, you know, it's a great fighting machine if you like, and it will get out there and do things. Um, equally, to get it to change something that it may not want to do, to not quite be the thing that you like to move on. Uh, also, at times, can be a bit of a challenge. So just dealing with that, I find a constant, well, a revelation in many ways, but equally, it can be frustrating. Because sometimes they find a similar frustration from the point of view. Doesn't anybody here that this IT support? Doesn't anybody here that's got a bureaucracy that's not going to do 
census over the last 10 years, or the one that's just uh, been published, then 25% of the growth of this country's population <coughs> occurred in London. It went from a population of about 7.4 million up to 8.2. So that happened in 10 years. And in fact, that was an accelerating rate, really, towards the end of it, as we see in different parts of the country. Um, the mix in London is different in, uh, in terms of uh, diversity. Uh, black minority ethnic groups, there are about one in three on average. And in some boroughs, it's about 70%. And that's great. What's happened within that, of course, is the pace of change has been remarkable. We're talking about a period of time. And one of the boroughs I often talk about is, um, is Newham, for those who know it. Newham is out of the east. Uh, there are 100,000 Lithuanians in this country, 50,000 of them live in, in Newham. Nothing wrong with Lithuania, but so it was a speed at which this, this growth happened. I don't know if you've ever heard of the term beds and sheds. Have you, have you heard of that? Well, beds and sheds means that in Europe, where it also has your house, or the two of the boroughs in London, particularly where it happens, uh, people have built on the back of houses and garages, they've built extensions. No windows, no fire escape, or anything like that. And uh, you find that a lot of young men who live there, you, you see economic migration. And in Europe, there are about 25,000 people living in those sort of conditions. So nobody get a bank pension. But it's happened over a very quick period of time. <clears throat> so that rate of change, <coughs> and that type of change, has meant that all the public services are trying to work out how do they deal with that, that demand, and that sort of challenge and that complexity. And I don't think anybody's really worked out what all that means. But it's something that collectively uh, we're all having to, uh, to work our way through. There are challenges that we're, uh, we're facing at the moment, uh, probably only in list two or three. So we're still working our way through some of the operational challenges uh, over and above the 5.25 million telephone calls we get every year. We get a large number of telephone calls. That's the most frequent way people contact the police. They don't walk into police stations, they don't text us, they don't tweet, they don't email us. The majority of the way they will contact us, rightly or wrongly, is over the phone. So that's where they, if they want help, um, that, that's how they get hold of us. We made a promise this year that if they want us to go, we will not say we will not go. If you want to come, we'll come. We now visit another.
given it said that Gordon Brown detailed his child's uh, medical condition or blight from a doctor or from a, you know, a med source of medical data. If I saw a potential source of medical data, I'd get this information. No uh, in some senses, people say, well, this is not serious. <coughs> So there are an awful lot of change things that we've got to do. However, in saving that money, we will make, I think, we will achieve some great things too. So despite having bored those people, we will have more constables than we've ever had in the Met's history. So at the moment, the Met in its history, <coughs> after 32,000 cops, 24,500 new constables. These are the people that do it. There are the people who are in uniform, detectives, fraud investigators. We go from 24 and a half to 26,000. So we'll have more people who will do and less people who will manage. Uh, within that, we will have more, another 2,500 will point to our neighbor teams. So people say they want to see people on the street, they will. Because we'll put 2,500 into that element they said they most like. But I think it's a professionally good thing to do anyway. And then we'll put an extra thousand into response. And response are the people who, when you ring at 3 o'clock in the morning, they're the ones who always come. They're the ones who, 24 hours a day, they don't say it's not our job, they don't say, you know, we have specialists to come, we don't do it. They're the ones who have been hit too busy, they have to stack the jobs to get around to what they can. And over the years, the police service has seen that diminish quite significantly. The journalists have lost out. And yet, the telephone calls have gone up and up and up. So, for me, it's time to redress that balance. Not in the way that says that we don't have specialists to come for us. It's a great time, I think, to address, address that particular issue. And then uh, the only final thing I was going to talk about, so in my final two, was number one is that the, within all that uh, stuff as well, one of the things that Met leads on for the country is gas uh, We, Although it's been relatively uh, quiet, um, there have been quite a few arrests and quite a few charges. Um, in the run up to the Olympics, <coughs> there were 32 arrests and 26 people charged. Not because they were planning to attack the Olympics, but because they were perceived to be a threat uh, in terms of terrorism offences. So whether it be uh, Al-Qaeda 
So thanks very much for listening tonight. I appreciate it. Uh, you could have been what listening to Maria Le Pen, but anyway, probably been better off that time. But uh, thanks so much for listening and happy to take any questions should anybody want to do. Yeah. Okay. Oh, sorry, no, sorry. You have to take questions. Yeah. And I don't know people's names, so I'm going to go for hands. Sorry. My name's Clara. 
Um, so I found what you said about how, at, at the very end of your talk about, you know, you're there to help and who else are people going, you're the first point of call in times of despair or, you know, uh, of fear. And um, I'm doing my research currently on um, fictional depictions of the futuristic or dystopian city. And a very common theme is a sort of vilification of the police. And for some reason, authors think that in this alternate world or in a future world, the police are corrupt. And this is in cities like London, like New York, like Chicago. And so why do you think that, at least in movies, novels, and even songs, I can think of many, do we have such an aggressive and you know, unhappy relationship in the police, with the police when specifically you say, you know, we turn to you in times of need? Well, I mean, there's no doubt. I mean, there are some corrupt police. And we know that you, you can't, I mean, I think in the police in this country, UK, there are about 250,000 people in local policing. It's usually the people. So there will be corrupt people. There will be fools, there will be dips. You know, there are people who we should not employ. <clears throat> so I know some people have left down. And there have been some cases where you could point to awful examples. But you could have had doctors. Uh, you could have had politicians. You could have had journalists. So I think there's no doubt that if you're public service general, Yeah, I was wondering um, if you could be more specific about what it is that ranks police forces, because you want, you want to be the best, but also um, what it is that stops police forces focusing solely on those criteria that they get ranked on. What, what's the sort of just focusing on that and being the best and not an issue? What type of you? Just to be clear, do you mean the types of things that allow me to rank police forces? Uh, yeah, well, I don't know who actually ranks you. Like, who decides what is the right, police right. force? Um, um, there are, there are various methods. So when I was in Melissa, I give you one that we looked at then. First of all, they're not reliable on measure. So I think more measure can be distorted. Um, but I think if all the indicators point in the right direction, then probably the things going well, and if the reverse is true, they probably do not. So the types of things you can look at, we have you know, lots of stats. So you know, how many burglars are there? How much crime is there? So you know, when the crime is going up and down, you can argue about when the recorded crime catches everything. This is one indication. You compare the recorded crime with the British Crime Survey. Now, the British Crime Survey is an anonymous. 
I think there are a series of things that we can uh, be ranked in. And then the final measure, as one indicator, is whether we're spending money efficiently. And there is a measure of that too, about the money index, if you like. And the MEC is challenged on each of the index I just mentioned. We are challenged on many of them. Sometimes by size. We have a view of the police, a confidence of You like the new Cambridge police are great, you like a neutral view, I don't know, but you like a view. So if surveyed, you will give you a view. So we survey that all the time. And that shows at the moment about 60% of the people in London, 60% are confident in the Met. Higher when you're talking about the local police in uh, Hackney or Croydon or wherever, but as a whole, it's about 60%. So it can compare that around the country. And the other test is the satisfaction. from London in the first three groups, but in the last group, if you were in Carlisle, 
Well, that's the two who are, who are anyway. Um, it's just interesting, <laughs> why? I mean, you probably have your own career aspiration, but why would you want to join the police? Is it, have you had bad experience with the police, or is it something you just wouldn't want to do? It, to me, that's the most important question for me, is we've got 30 people, of which only two would think about joining the police officer. That answers the question. <laughs> <laughs> if anyone claimed to so say, you've probably got your own career aspirations, challenging enough career uh, and you talk it down rather than talk it up and because you don't have a direct entry graduate entry scheme you have a, a scheme that selects graduates who are already in the police maybe you should be doing some real thinking about how do you develop the Sorry, career system I was not misdescribe but it wasn't about graduates in the police the people I was talking about the people joining us from outside is that a metropolitan graduate entry scheme yeah. There'll well, be more, I mean, the lateral entry. Well, how, how, how can people know about that? Because in the debate from the Home Office about your direct entry, and I know you're a supporter of mm. superintendents, Derek, um, they, don't, they don't mention anything about the graduate entry scheme. When I was a student here, they had it on the milk crowd, and it was a, uh, it was a process that a bright Cambridge graduate aspiring to, to be a police officer could do so knowing they were going to get accelerated and, and there was a track record of some people going through quite fast. That seems to have died, it's had no publicity. Uh, and uh, although it is an artisan career, I don't think tonight you talked about some of the broader things, uh, the role of partnerships, the, the, the tackling of the causes of crime. You've been very focused on presenting the police career as just about catching thieves. And, and I wonder whether that's the right approach in today's time. That's an interesting challenge. I suppose in terms of the first point, the, the opportunity for people to recruit as superintendents or middle managers, right, uh, is talked about by one Tom Windsor's recommendations in his report. The whole office has yet to deliver a scheme that could work, but I'm ambitious to get stuck into it once we have a scheme. Because without training, I won't give anybody a job. I mean, the talent is fine, but I'm not going to put someone in charge of Lambeth who don't know what they're doing. You have people who are this, so you've got to know what they're doing. So I would say that given them 18 months to use of training, and then going and start doing some of the other things. But without the selection process, without training, it's a hot air. So for me, something has to move from that side here to doing it. So the only thing we've been able to do locally um, is that, I think, I can't remember the exact number of people who are interested now, but there was an advertising process which led to, you know, a recruiting firm who went out there and got some graduates. And from what I hear, it sounded very good. So what exactly how they did it, but it was to, when going to the pool of undergraduate particular, we were thinking about new careers. Um, in terms of the, the point about... But that's a good example. I'll just, I'll just finish on to answer your second point, which is in terms of, you know, uh, partnership, etc. I'm all for that. But I've worked in the police service for 30 years, as taught partnership and as taught what? You know, we have partnership going out of our ears. So what? You know, what? what's he going to do? Because without some crime fighting, just hot air. And my, my argument would be not that that doesn't have value, because I also think it does. Although I don't, I think the police have got to be clear about what they expect of partnership, not just working in partnership. And I think that's been pretty placid in the past. But I think the first requirement of a professional is to do your own job. So I'd be quite right to have concentrated on, you know, what solves crime. And sadly, at times, managers, leaders in the police haven't known what cuts crime. We've got this vague idea that putting police on the street, more about forensics. You know, you're paying five million quid a year for forensics that don't catch, catch any burglars. Not a bad idea to sort that out. So for me, that is a starting point. But I, don't, I agree with you, it's not all. Because certainly, if you're going to go for crime reduction, which I would argue that obviously you could do the best thing, <clears throat> there's probably three or four ways that you can make a real difference. So alcohol, drugs, design, good people. Concentrate those four areas, you will make an impact on crime. You know, I don't know whether anybody been into the cells. So I like one or two people might. Around, so I'm not CSU being locked up, but it's <laughs> yeah, been around. 
But, you know, if you were to go into cells here tonight, 78% of people on the table will be alcohol affected. Alcohol causes growth. I'm not arguing for prohibition. I'm arguing for some limits and this and for around spot. Uh, drugs. Is that a big predetermined crime? Oh, you know, we you know, look to the people, is it? I think 83% of the people who go to prison have got a drug habit. By the time they come out, they've all got a drug habit. The other 17% get their drug habit in prison. So, drugs are a big driver of crime. You design, we design out war crime, the most effective me me mechanism for reducing crime being design. So burglaries come down to, it's about a 27 year low. Some people believe that burglaries go through, it's actually a 27 year low, because it's being designed out. Right, the alarms and, and windows. And then you look at cars. You, it's very hard to steal a car. It's not impossible, but you need a key. Some people find different ways of getting one key. <clears throat> but the design change has been that we've reduced the number of cars stolen. So for me, that's a vital part. I know that if you looked at young people, they're not all out of the criminal, but they're disproportionate either victims or suspects in crime. So if you can have strategies around that, then you know, it can make a real difference. And I'm not for you with all those other things. So I don't disagree with your fundamental point that partnership is helpful as we, you know, for us to influence that. But I think you've got to be really clear about what we're in the partnerships for. And I think at times, I must speak for myself, that the police role in there is going to be So we sort of got it to the stuff three, which was the war on crime, victims and professionals. Uh, so that they, they sort of resisted this, this technology part, but the strategy is developing now. And for me, it's a vital thing. It's quite difficult when you try to save money and you're losing people's jobs. Because what you're doing is trading kit for people for the why you try to save money. Uh, but it, it is, uh, is going to happen. Uh, and I'm confident that we can do it. The biggest inertia in the system we've got is that two thirds of our 350 million pound a year is an outsourced contract which comes to fruition in about, well, comes to the end in about 18 months time. That's an opportunity to move on. And with that inertia in the system, I can't just flip my fingers and see it change. But we've got 18 months of thinking time and we need to make best use of that. Stop searching a lot this year. Certainly, my view when I arrived was that there was a problem with it. I can't say that. What let me really start with this. It seems to me that in terms of the riots, one of the things that I was a bit disappointed by was the fact that all the things we have public inquiries about, we never had a public inquiry about the riots. And I found that a bit odd because it was something that had such a profound effect. And nobody really had fixed it. I said, well, you know, first of all, in chronology, what happened that night? <coughs> what happened on the 16th night? What were the facts? Number two is what's the context in which those facts occur and what can we learn from that to prevent a certain thing happening time and time again. So for me, I think we've had partial accounts of that period. But I arrived in the Met just, I think it's about, if I, not very good, uh, if you remember, the, the previous commissioner resigned or retired, I think on the Sunday, or within about two weeks the rights occurred. And in that two week period, I got into the Met as the acting deputy commissioner. And uh, I suppose what You'd have to be immune to all feedback to not hear from people who lived in London because of the problem around stop search. You could look at the stats, and I've told you one story, but you have a public meeting, you meet people, and the thing that was killing us, and I'm not saying.
saying is being totally removed, but I'll explain in a second what we've done to try and help, is that people who say, well, my son, if you have to be black, never be in trouble in his life. So, first of all, it was happening frequently, and then the second challenge became, are we doing it well, even when we do it, are we doing it well? Now, to some extent, having been stopped seven times, you get a bit better. So, your reaction will potentially fuel a conflict that neither party intends, but you know, it's difficult to contain once the emotion has gotten away. So, what we wanted to do, we failed two or three things. One was that, I don't know how much you know about stop search, but are you aware of Section 44 stop search? So Section 44 was in the Counter-Terrorism Act, and it came in probably about 10 years ago, only stopped in London probably three or four years ago. And when it was in, it was in right across London. It was never really intended to be right across the city, but that's how it worked. Partly on the back of 77, and obviously the attacks in London. It's a pretty, it's a pretty 
was quite intrigued by different police cultures and how they respond to, to being laughed at. I thought that would have made for a lot of Yeah. Um, so, two part question really. The first one was, uh, the first part is, how important I said, Barry, is your relationship with the mayor and deputy mayor and um, facilitating the work that you do? And the second part is, a lot, um, a lot of police forces, particularly military police forces, I would imagine, are very envious of the attention and the money that are arguably just finally given to the Metropolitan Police. How do you, when working with the uh, working with the police, how do you try and negotiate your own I think in terms of the, um, the mayor and the deputy mayor, the relationship is really good. It's um, with the politicians, but they've got political agendas that they need to, to, to meet. But certainly my experience of working with politicians <coughs> In terms of, so that, that for me it's always been a fundamental thing, whether it's been a police authority or Boris and Stephen, is that I've always thought that if, if we've got a good professional argument, which you know, those may not agree with, but if you could persuade them, as they would say a lay person, of the validity of your argument, it's not valid to If you can't, if you start with the police authority, and after an hour of explaining something, they still say, I've got stuff to talk about, I don't agree with you, then probably it means that your argument's not very well formed. So I think you should be able to take people with you on the whole, if you've got a good argument. And in that sense it works. Of course, I can't do it money. I'd love to be able to, but you can't. That's what politicians do part of their board. They're there to do another change of law, to influence things that, you know, the discussion I had earlier about partnership, you know. I can't do the what the education people do about truancy, which is a good link into, into crime. Um, we, you know, we, we've got, and to, in terms of reducing crime, we've got some great opportunities in them. One is about gangs, we've got things we can do about gangs when there's only a few thousand of them that are counting 25% serious violence, 50% of muggings, so shootings, 20% of muggings, 15% serious sexual violence. If we could do something about them, we can enforce the law. But our strategy around gangs, for example, is that we will enforce the law, but we need to die.
So going back to New York, so I think you know, there has been some indication that we're getting a slight change. I mean, in the recession, we've not seen, we still, I think, last year in London, we had about 4% of the inflation in crime. Not much, but 5-4% yeah, is trend trend, so in five years, we could see a significant drop. So I think we're still seeing that broadly crime goes down, even in the recession, although I suspect that employment not being reduced to be a high level that people anticipated. Um, but I think the reason for crime dropping, I think I'll go back to you know, the, the discussion we were having earlier. I think you know, the, the basics are good design and can really make a difference. I, I do argue for alcohol control, not for removal. But you know, I mean, over the years, you know, you, people in the room won't be old enough to remember, but you know, if you wanted an off license, so you went to a shop and got alcohol, you had to make a good argument to have that license. And one of the tests was does this area need an off license? Thank you. 
so for me, I think anything can be done to, to help them in their support of society. Uh, it's going to be a good investment. And I'm not, uh, has anybody been in prisons? Anybody been in prison? Right. I mean, people seem to think that they're wonderful places. Uh, you know, you've got TV on the rest of it, but I've worked on them. I mean, the smell, you share the cell with people you wouldn't want to share. Say, actually, this happened every week. Don't mean that they're actually going to start meeting us all the time. 
across the chamber, I think, one of the things, and you know, people have talked about whether or not you, you look at the offensive rate and keep the same sentence, but look about whether you, you look at whether or not with an existing relationship, whether or not the, you describe the offence in a different way, even if you say it's as serious as any other form of rape. Because uh, it seems to me that you could have a successful prosecution, because so without that, not here. So, and it may just be the police are very good, or CPS are very good at that. There's something there for me in that society. Thank you, Commissioner, for an absolutely fascinating talk and for answering so many questions in so much. Can we just thank Commissioner Hogan for coming?